like I haven't done this in forever. Hey y'all, what's up? I'm Faith. Welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome. I am a full-time stay-at-home mom, part-time bookseller, all the time reader, living and working in Eastern North Carolina. And today we are going to be talking about all the books that I read in January, 2021. It still feels weird to say 2021. So in January, I read 24 books, which was a lot, a lot more than I expected I was going to read. 24 books, which came out to 6,815 pages. 14 of those were in print. 10 of them were on audiobook. Two of them were from the library. That's not on my wrap up sheet here, but that's true. Um, and yeah, we're going to try to go through this super fast because my kids are currently distracted by a TV show and that won't last that long. And then they'll be coming upstairs, banging on the door, wanting to ask me a question. What question? I don't know. So the first book I read in January was Across the Green Grass Fields by Shauna McGuire. This is book six in her Wayward Children series. It was sent to me by Tor.com because they love me. Okay, there's just gonna be kid noise. Sorry. They're playing. They're happy. Hey. Okay. <laughs> anyway, this is a, um, every other book in the series is a standalone, and then the odd-numbered books are tied in to the overarching story about the school for children who come back from Portal Worlds. So this is a standalone. It is about a young girl who runs away and finds herself in a horse world. And she doesn't fit in well in our world and she's struggling with her identity and so she gets to go be the only human. <laughs> it's really good. I enjoyed it. I know some people haven't, but I, I enjoyed it a lot. The next book I read was Broken in the Best Way by Jenny Lawson. This is her latest collection. It will be out in April. I was provided an audio copy advanced copy by Libro FM and I loved it. It was hilarious. There were sections where I was laughing so hard I was crying and my kids were trying to sleep and my door was open because I was trying to keep an eye on them, make sure they went to bed and I was trying so hard to hold it in and I was just sobbing laughing. So if you enjoyed Jenny Lawson, check it out. And then I read Goodbye Things by Fumio Sasaki. This is a book about minimalism, translated from the Japanese. Uh, I didn't like it. I gave it two stars. Um, <laughs> there's a whole section about how all minimalists are thin, and I was like, yeah, okay, done with you. I know some people love it. Meh. Read Heidi's Guide to Four Letter Words by Tara Sivek and Andy Ernst. Um, this is about a woman who is a kindergarten teacher and gets laid off and so takes a job as a receptionist at an audiobook publisher where they record erotic romances. And it was okay. It was funny. I gave it three stars. I didn't love it, but I didn't hate it. There you go. I did love Amari and the Night Brothers by B.B. Alston. This is everywhere, so if you pay any attention to kid book internet, uh, you've seen it. It just came out this month. It is about Amari, who is a young black girl living in Atlanta. Her brother is missing, and so she takes a summer camp internship to try to get a scholarship, but really it is a secret agency that he used to work for that uh, it was like Men in Black, but for the supernatural. <laughs> and so she's trying to figure out what happened to him and also be able to stay in school. And it was really fun. If you're looking for something to fill the uh, Turf Ladies books hole in your life, this, this is it. This is great. I read Perfect on Paper by Sophie Gonzalez. This was sent to be my Wednesday books. It comes out in March and it is about a teenage girl who's a junior in high school 
and ha goes to this like super fancy private school in California because her mother teaches there and she has been running a secret advice locker where you leave a note and ten dollars and then she will email you back and her advice is almost always spot on and if it doesn't work then she'll refund your money and it was fun I think I gave her four stars um, so the conflict comes because he catches her at the very beginning of the book and nobody, absolutely nobody knows who she is except for her sister who um, has graduated. And so he catches her and he's like, well, I need help. So you're, I will pay you to be my personal relationship coach. So she has to help him get his girlfriend back. But maybe she starts to be attracted to him and maybe he starts to be attracted to her. But also, she has always been in love with her best friend, always. She has been in love for a very long time with her best friend and um, might have used her advice locker to make sure that her best friend didn't get in a relationship. So there's that conflict and of course it's high school so everything blows up in the most dramatic way possible and there's drunk children and it's it's teen craziness. It was fun. They go to Disney and reading this in quarantine for 12 months and they go to Disney. I was just like, oh, people. <laughs> I miss people. I read Strange the Dreamer by Lonnie Taylor. This was our YA for Adults book club pick for January. It's a brick. I listened to most of it, which is how I got through it, because the prose is so lovely that it's hard for me to read it in print because I can't read as fast as I normally would, so I listened to it while doing projects around the house that didn't require my brain. And um, it was really beautiful. And I'm pissed that I had a cliffhanger ending because I don't have room for another giant doorstop anytime soon, but I do own book two and I will be reading it. I gave this four and a half stars um, because while I really enjoyed it, there was some stuff where I was like, Meh. but it's Lonnie Taylor. It's a whole mythology. It's crazy and twisty and super fun and tragic. I listened to the audiobook for Iron and Velvet. This is a book that I heard pitched as uh, what if after Twilight Bella left Edward, did not become a vampire, and like he continued to moon about following her as an angsty teen and she was like, oh my god, get away from me, and realized that she really was a lesbian. <laughs> And becomes, I say, I, I described it as Bella grows up and becomes a lesbian Harry Dresden. So it's wild and wacky. It is a romance. Uh, she gets it on with a couple different women who may not be human. Um, but she's a paranormal investigator in London trying to solve a murder. It was fun. It was a good time. I listened to the book in like a day. <laughs> And then I read First Become Ashes by K.M. Spara. This is the new book from the author of Docile, which I loved. I loved this more. I gave this book five stars. I don't know what it is about cult books this year, um, but <laughs> man, are they doing it for me. So First Become Ashes is about a, a character a man named Meadowlark. He is a few months shy of his quarter century and he lives in a compound of a cult called the Fellowship that has been there. I think they call it the Fellowship. It's been, you know, 20 something books since I read this one. Um, but he <laughs> has never left. Like it's this old zoo that they converted into their compound and they just happen to be in the middle of a city, but they've never left. And something happens and they get raided by the FBI, but he thinks he has this magical power. Does he? Don't know. Uh, that's one of the fun, like, there's a lot of ambiguity in this book and like, it could be magic. It could be completely rational. And like your characters that you're following are trying to decide what they believe. Um, but he thinks he has this magic. He's one of the anointed ones, 
but the way they access their magic is through um, pain and abuse and um, there, yeah, so this book has a ton of content warnings and needs them, but I feel like I keep saying this, but this book, I finished it and I was not depressed. I felt some hope. I cried some tears of joy for some of the characters, but you follow Metalark and this cosplayer he runs into and um, another person from the cult. You follow the three of them in present time moving forward as Meadow Lurk goes on this quest to try to defeat the monsters to free the world. And you follow Meadow Lark's partner in the past leading up to the FBI raid to learn about what happened to them in the cult. And yes, there is a lot of really horrible stuff that happens, but it's not used to like be, ooh, well, that's so interesting. Like it is, this is a horrible thing that happened to a person. And now we are dealing with the fallout of trauma and processing trauma and processing what you believe about yourself and about the world. And I just, oh, it's so hard to explain this book and I can't wait for it to come out. I feel like with Do like Docile, it's going to be very controversial because it's uh, not an easy read. <laughs> but I like there's something about the way K.M. Sparrow writes and the way that K.M. Sparrow explains trauma in this like speculative way that really works. So this comes out in April from Tor.com and I can't wait. I read The Past is Red. I no longer have my physical art because I passed it on to my friend who's also a bookseller because she's obsessed with this author. Um, and I will be pre-ordering it because there might be a pre-order campaign happening, but we don't have the specific details on that yet. Stay tuned to your local indie bookstore. <laughs> um, but this was a novella. It comes out from Tor.com. It's out in July. And it is about a post-apocalyptic world. Climate change has destroyed the world. The seas have risen. And the few bits of humanity that have survived lived on these, like, like the Pacific garbage patch that we hear about. That. That is where they live. So they live on Garbage Town. And we follow our protagonist. She is, in the first half, she is a younger, like, teen um, who thinks that where she lives is the greatest place on earth and why would you want to go back to uh, what we lived through and when they just like disposed of everything and you um, the her world is built up like every area she lives in an area made up of candles and like there's an area made up of like pills and like, so all of humanity's discards, and I am friends with another bookseller on Twitter who said, and I was like, yes, she was like, everything I used that was disposable after I read this book gave me severe anxiety. And yes. So the first half is hopeful and she's moving towards um, an event that you know is going to happen. And then the second half, it time jumps and it's after the fact and she's still dealing with do we want to have hope for humanity to go back to the way things were? Um, and there are some twists that I was like, wait, what? <laughs> are you serious? For a book this short, I, it blew my mind. It was, it was just excellent. I loved it. So I can't wait for everybody else to read it. And I think it's going to be really popular among people who are into climate fiction. Because uh, that is a thing now. So definitely check out The Past is Red. Red. I read a lot of tour novellas, tour.com novellas, um, in January. Remote Control by Nnedi Okorafor. I'm not going to talk a lot about this because I did discuss it in a Friday Reads video. Um, this was my first Nnedi Okorafor uh, novel or book. Um, and I do remember that people have talked about how Binti does not have a full resolution in the traditional storytelling sense but that the author is very adamant that she finished it the way she wanted to, and that's fine. Uh, so this does not resolve what you think it is. They pitch, you know, they say um, she is the adopted daughter of 
the angel of death, beware of her, mind her, death guards her like one of its own. She's not actually the adopted daughter of the angel of death. That's what I thought I was getting into, which is why I was disappointed. Um, but she is a girl with a power and she does kill people. <laughs> um, but she, it, there's no like angel. That's just the like superstition that spreads around her about the angel of death. But she is going through trying to find something and trying to figure out what happened to her. Do you figure out what happened to her? <laughs> so yeah, I gave it like three and a half stars. It was good, but it just wasn't what I thought I was getting. And that was a, disappointing for me. I read Concrete Rose by Angie Thomas. This is her latest. It is about Maverick Carter, who is the father of Star, who is the protagonist of The Hate You Give. So we follow him as he becomes a teenage father um, and deals with the ramifications of where he lives and gang involvement and his father's in jail because he was a leader of a gang and like it was very raw and very real and um people talk about and it's true we need more stories that meet kids and re teenage readers where they are and there are kids who are dealing with this so it is nice to see that portrayed in fiction and angie thomas does it with such compassion for her characters i just i wanted to wrap him up in a hug and be like it's gonna be okay let me hold this baby for you while you go take a nap so five stars and I listened to the audio and the audio was excellent. I listened to the audio for Wintering, which is a memoir about the author's experiences having to take a sabbatical from work and really think about wintering as a concept and, um, and like, taking a break and being in a season of less productivity and how, you know, the world goes through that. We have winter and, um, you know, there aren't the, everything kind of animals hibernate and trees lose their leaves and all of that. So it was very good. Um, I don't think I can do a very good job explaining it, but I did talk about it in a Friday reads video and I did enjoy it. And if you like kind of that, memoir about a thing that happens to someone and they use it as a way to look at the world and like really think about how we live life winter i read for real by alexis hall this was a pick for faded mates podcast for one of the roots they did in january so i read it i talked a lot about it i gave it four stars it's a little long but if that's my only complaint, I'm okay with that. <sighs> okay, we had to take a break for a child-related meltdown. <laughs> um, I think I was talking about to start over with it. So I read Sally Hepworth's The Good Sister. This was sent to me by St. Martin's Press. It comes out in April, 2021. And um, Sally Hepworth is the author of The Mother-in-Law, which was a big thriller uh, 2019, I want to say. Um, so this is a thriller that takes place in Australia. It is about twin girls. Um, they're adults now, so it's about twin sisters. <laughs> um, one works in the library, so there's this whole component of the book that's like a love letter to the library and everything it does for a community. Um, but one works in the library and the other, um, is trying, has event planning, her job's not important, um, and wants to have a baby, but has found out that she can't. Um, and her husband has taken a position in London. So you're following, you're reading journal entries from the one sister, the, the married sister, and then the sister who works in the library you're following along in like present day as it moves forward so they're alternating you don't really know what happened you know that someone did something that caused someone to die when they were children you know that they had a housing situation but it really comes down to what you remember about your childhood 
and how you interpret that information because they have very different perspectives on what happened to them as children and the rest of their lives. Um, one sister is um, neurodiverse and I don't think they ever give a diagnosis for her, but it's very clear early on. And at first I was really concerned. I actually stopped and went and looked at reviews to make sure that like there wasn't anybody own voices saying, you know, this is a terrible representation of a neurodiverse individual because she has a lot of like sensory concerns and processing. Like she's a very literal processor. She reminded me a lot of Eleanor and Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine. Um, but to a more, um, to, to another level. Um, and part of that is because you're getting the perspective of her sister telling you about her. Um, and so you get into a whole situation of, yeah, I was really concerned about the portrayal of the, um, of the neurodiverse sister, but, um, it's important to the book that she is portrayed a certain way, uh, but it does resolve at the end. So if you can push through, um, it is not bad rep. It is set up that way for a reason. Um, but that could be triggering for some people. So I think it's important to note that yes, there is neurodiverse rep in this book, but it's not on voices and it is uh, used to further the plot. Um, there's also content warnings for child abuse and stuff like that. Like it is a thriller and I gave it four stars. Um, the whole treatment of the neurodiverse sister and how she's viewed by her sister really just bothered me the whole book, but it's supposed to. So that comes out in April. I read Sun Daughters, Sea Daughters by Amy Ogden. This comes out in February from Tor.com. This is uh, The Little Mermaid as a space opera. It is very short. It is very, like, drop you in this world. Don't tell you anything about it. Good luck. Um, I gave it four stars. It was interesting. I still need to write a review about it. Uh, it was queer. It is, if Ariel, um, so this is a future in which humans have been uh, evolving and biohacked and so you have a group that evolved into the ocean and you have a group that evolved onto land and then you have more that are off planet and the group so the little mermaid we're just gonna go with that because I can't remember her actual name uh, a toile who is it you know gene edited and biohacked human, um, left before the events of the book, left the sea, got the sea witch who was actually her maybe lover, uh, to uh, give her, uh, modifications so that she could survive on land and went, she's the daughter of the sea clan lord and she's gone to marry, you know, the land clan lord. He is not important to the story. So the way the book opens, he is ill and she is going back to find the sea witch um, to try to get her to help find a cure for this plague that is affecting the land dwelling humans. And so she gets there and the sea witch lives in a spaceship and they have to go off planet. And so you meet all these different groups of people. Um, but the title comes from, <laughs> she struggles to have children because she is gene edited. Um, but also like, yeah, I don't want to explain anything because it's so short, but it was like a fun, weird thought experiment. And that is the point of half of these tour novel tour.com novellas. So it was fun and weird and different. I read Culture Warlords by Talia Lavin. I have been on the hold list for this book from my library since November. Um, and I'm glad I had already put myself on the hold list because after the events of January 6th in which there was an insurrection in the United States, um, this became even more like top of mind for people. So this is the 
um, Talia Lavin's journey into the dark web of white supremacy. Talia Lavin is a Jewish woman who went undercover into white supremacist and alt-right spaces online to infiltrate and, um, you know, to, uh, to infiltrate them and then find people's identities and give it to, uh, um, and anti-fascist organizations so that they could, uh, prevent violence and stop violent, uh, individuals. So, yeah, it's really relevant right now. I listened to the audiobook. I got the audiobook from Libro FM because I started reading this. Of course, I had this on my hold list before everything happened. So I started reading it and it was giving me nightmares. And I was like, if I listen to it, then it's still horrible, but it's a different medium and I'm not reading it right before bed. Um, so sometimes that is one of my hacks for books that are really affecting me. And it was excellent. I gave it five stars. I loved it. I think Talia Laban is really intelligent and um, articulate, unlike me, individual who really, she finds a way to explain these people in a way that's not sympathetic, but that you feel like, okay, I still think it's terrible what they're doing. And I don't understand how you can be this person, but I can see the path of how we got here. Ooh, excuse me. Um, but yeah, it's really good. Highly recommend it. It is a hard read, but it's really, it's just excellent. I read Low Country, a Southern Memoir by J. Nicole Jones. This comes out in April from Catapult. They sent me this advanced copy. This is J. Nicole Jones' memoir about about growing up in the low country if you are not from the american south the low country is south carolina coastal region uh jay nicole jones grew up in um myrtle beach her family owned um her grandparents owned restaurants and hotels uh if you're from the american eastern east coast of the united states myrtle beach is like the south's jersey shore <laughs> is how I would describe it, uh, only not as rich. So she lives in this like weird um, space between her grandparents who have a ton of money, but her grandfather won't give anybody any money. So her parents like work in restaurants and work for the family and they don't have a lot of money. So she sees all the wealth, but she doesn't have all the wealth. Um, and like her grandmother gives her these beautiful dolls and stuff but at the same time, like, they can't afford their house payments. Um, and her parents are together, and then they divorce, and then they're together, and, like, her father finally leaves and becomes a country music star, and um, her mother's father lives uh, in Charlotte area and is very wealthy, and, um, you know, finally they go live with him, and he pays for her to go to private school. So she's living in this, like, in between these extremes, and her, I, I marked this quote because it was my favorite part of this. Like, I feel like it sums up this whole book. A parable so perfect that Jesus could not have done it any better than my Nana. She's talking about why she wrote this book. Maybe he did, but I confess I have never read the good book and have no plans in the future. I am choosing the stories from the mouths of women, some painted and some bare. And as far as I'm concerned, their words are all the truer for the color. I am also putting off what I cannot bear to lose for good. And like a hurricane, I will change tack without warning. So this book is, um, it's about her life, her childhood, but it, it follows, um, she dips in and out of folklore. She dips in and out of ghost stories. And I live, I have lived on the North Carolina coast. I grew up in the North Carolina mountains. I am from... Uh, the very edge of Appalachia. So I'm not from the low country, but I'm very familiar with it. And so, um, and I lived on the border of North Carolina, South Carolina. So we spent a lot of time in South Carolina. So these stories felt very familiar. And this whole book felt very, if not quite like coming home, it felt very close to that. 
And so she dips in and out of folklore and ghost stories and a history of these hurricanes that re have reshaped the coastline and how Myrtle Beach came to be. And a lot of it is following her grandmother who got into an abusive marriage and never left, but like had was really smart and could have done things and chose not to. And like, it's just, it's exactly what the stories of Southern women feel like, if that makes sense. So I really, I, I really liked it. I cannot wait for this to be out in the world. I think memoir readers are gonna love it. I think people who love Southern writing are gonna love it. Um, it's just, it's a beautiful gritty book and I just, I loved it. Completely switching gears, I read Enjoy the View by Sarah Morgenthaler. This is book three in the Moose Springs, Alaska series. I listened to a lot of this on audio. Uh, these are not quite clean romances, but the door is closed. <laughs> this one follows Easton Lockett and River, I can't remember River's last name, River Lane. She is an actress who's trying to pivot to being a director, and so she's filming a documentary in Alaska, but Moose Springs, Alaska, if you've read the other books, is notorious for not wanting tourists, even though they are a tourist town, and he runs a climbing expedition company and so they go on this expedition to hike Mount Vale which is a very dangerous mountain and like there's blizzards and people fall through the ice and so this one's much more adventurous than the last two and I thought it was super fun. Red of Women and Salt by Gabriela Garcia. This comes out from Flatiron Books in April. This is getting a lot, a lot of buzz, so you've probably seen it, and if you haven't, you will. Um, it is about two families of women. Um, it alternates timelines and perspectives, uh, but one group is an immigrant from Cuba, the mother and then the daughter. The mother immigrates from Cuba and the daughter is born in the United States, and um, you get a lot of the Cuban history and why the mother immigrated and her family's legacy back in Cuba. And then you have another group and it is a migrant mother from El Salvador and her daughter. They migrated when the daughter was a baby and um, the book opens with the Cuban mother's daughter the book doesn't open with that. It opens historically, but the Cuban mother's daughter is watching out the window as the El Salvadorian mother is taken away by ice. But then the daughter comes home from school and she's eight and the mother's not there. So the other daughter takes her in for a while and helps her. Um, and is she going to turn her over to the authorities? And then you jump forward in time and then you jump back in time. It's like the publisher describes it as a kaleidoscope and I think that's very appropriate. I had to actually go through and write myself a timeline of all the years next to the chapters. But each chapter is narrated by a different person and each chapter is um, a different, almost every chapter you're jumping around in time. Um, but this has gotten blurred by Roxanne Gay. She has picked it up for her book club. Um, it made me want to call my mom. Um, but yeah, it deals with the concept of who's a good immigrant and who deserves to be able to immigrate and um, women dealing with violence and revolution and trying to take care of their children and the choices that mothers will make and all of that in this nice slim little book. And I loved it. I thought it was excellent. I read Storm Song by C.L. Polk. This is book two of the um, the Witchmark series. I can't remember the name of the trilogy. The Kingston Cycle. Uh, book three is coming out this month. I have an arc. I need to read it. But um, this one follows the sister of the protagonist from book one. These are all queer. So this one is a sapphic romance but it immediately follows the events of book one. So I can't really explain too much, but they're like a steampunky alternate reality with elves. Okay. And soul magic and controlling the weather 
and it's basically Britain. And yeah, this one has a lot of political intrigue. Um, and are people going to get killed? <laughs> and I'm really interested to see how this all wraps up in book three, because I think we're moving towards overthrowing the monarchy and establishing a democracy, but I'm not sure. I read Big Friendship. Um, I got this as an audiobook from the library, and it is really good. I don't listen to the podcast that these authors have, but I listened to their interview on the Stacks podcast, and I was fascinated by them talking about not only the concept of friendship, but the concept of interracial friendship, and the concept of uh, friendships at a distance, and what makes a big friendship, and go into friendship therapy. Like, they went to couples therapy as friends, and like, the friendships you establish as a younger adult versus as, when you're older, and yeah, it was really good, and I recommend it. <laughs> I read Blonde Indian by Ernstine Hayes. This is a memoir, the, the January pick for the Erin and Danny's, um, book club. This is a her memoir about uh, her life as an Alaskan Native child. It, it also follows um, some of her ancestors through the history of Indigenous First Nations people who are being taken off their land, who are being sent to missionary schools, um, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, losing fisheries. Um, it was intense. It is an intense book. Uh, this takes place in Juneau, Alaska. I have not been to Juneau. I have been to Anchorage. So I kind of had a mental picture, but I have no firsthand experience. But parts of it take place in California. And it was really good. And The March Pick is Ernestine Hayes' next memoir, so Tao of Raven. So I'm looking forward to reading that and seeing how her writing evolves. And then the last book I read was Chlorine Sky. I listened to the audiobook. It is a novel in verse about a young black girl who's a really good basketball player and um, her father is in jail and so she's the daughter of a single mother and has an older sister who does has more friends at school and the book opens her best friend has kind of ditched her. And she doesn't really understand why and so you're following her through these life changes as she's trying to figure out boys and trying to figure out friends and trying to figure out who she is and who she wants to be and can she make new friends and it's just oh it felt like a late summer day at the pool when all your friends have all your friends have plans and you're just trying to figure out what you want to do with your life. I really liked it. I'm really excited to see what else this author does. Okay, so those are the 24 books that I read in the month of January. Hopefully this video is not an hour plus long, but we will see. Uh, what did you guys read this month? What did you enjoy? Tell me all about it. Let me know down in the comments. I look forward to hearing from you. I'm gonna go put my kids down for a nap now, <laughs> but like, comment, subscribe. Bye y'all.